Thank you very much, Christine, as well, for inviting me to speak here today and uh, part of this. I have to admit I'm also not um, a person in fashion or even fashion history. I'm an art historian and I mostly study ancient cultures and um, so my perspective is very broad, um, both geographically and chronologically. I should say, though, for those of you here in, in at FIT that Traditionally, most of you get a good deal of your history through the history of art. Actually, FIT has no history department, and that's because from the very beginning, the institution uh, was focused on visual culture and communicating through visual culture, and so the history of art department at FIT is actually one of the largest and finest in the country, and certainly in the city. Um, we teach classes uh, throughout all the five continents, um, and we are very focused on Asia as well. Um, I teach a class with my colleagues mostly about India, and we also have a class, um, HA223, uh, which is about the Far East. One thing we don't do, however, is Southeast Asia. Uh, it's very rare for any of us as art historians to be trained in Southeast Asian art. Um, uh, there are many reasons for that in terms of just the history of how um, different disciplines grow. And India, there's been a long tradition of European and American scholars studying the art of India and certainly the art of the Far East. Uh, Southeast Asia is much more rare. Um, after teaching here at FIT, however, for the last 12 years and a course on India, I felt it was really a lost opportunity that many of you are interested in, industries are moving into Southeast Asia, and it's also a part of the world that really deserves to be understood in a global um, in a global way. And so uh, the generous support of FIT last year, I was sent or went to Cambodia for a month and lived in Siem Reap, which is really the area of the height of the Khmer um, Empire, excuse me. Um, and this map here is really a map of the Silk Road, and you can see um, Southeast Asia here is part of the Silk Road from both directions, either coming from India um, or coming from the Far East. And so it's really, if you look at it in that way, it's really the center of the Silk Route um, and not on its periphery in any way. Um, now the empire that I'm talking about here, that is the Khmer Empire, that reigns from about the 9th century to the 13th century, so 400 year reign. Um, what you're seeing here is an aerial view of Angkor and um, what's on the, the left here is one of the largest man-made um, forms anywhere in the world, which is a large uh, rectilinear basin for water. And water really was symbolically understood as coming from, and actually it literally did come from the Himalayas here, uh, down into Southeast Asia, and you can see these tributary rivers here, that they believed that they were gathering those waters of the Himalaya, which was the home of Shiva, uh, the Hindu god Shiva, but also the home of the beginning of Buddhism. And the fabulous kind of uh, growth of the Khmer Empire depended upon interpreting these Indian, Hindu, and also Buddhist uh, ideologies. But also the Khmer empire was known for its silk production. Uh, the stones, uh, the one you see uh, here from the Bayon from the 12th century in Khmer are, are really quite famous of these magnificent uh, images of the face of the emperor Rajar Jasvara VII as the uh, Buddha of compassion. And there are hundreds and hundreds of these composite uh, monolithic images of his face throughout Angkor. These stones, of course, remain. Um, the silk, however, produced um, in the 11th, 12th, 13th century do not. But we know there is a great deal of evidence that, that Cambodia participated in the silk route, not only in the production of silk, but the manufacturing of silk. Um, they mastered the process of ikat um, weft weaving, which is one of the most complicated kinds of weaving in terms of, especially when creating patterns that are this tight and in focus when you're dealing with a weft design. Um, for those of you who are weavers, you know what I'm talking about. Otherwise, um, just trust me that once you warp your loom, if you're bringing in the design on the weft, uh, it takes a great deal of coordination and care. 
Um, the detail you're looking at here is from the 19th century, and most of the historical cloth we have does not go back much further than that from this region. And even after the fall of the um, Angkor Empire that is represented by the stone sculpture, uh, Cambodia would be um, colonized or ruled by rulers as far as from China or Laos or Thailand or other parts of the region, but they still continued uh, in their Buddhist practice especially and in their weaving of silk. Um, so there's a long historical trajectory for hundreds uh, and in relation to silk for thousands of years of high level production that was part of the um, silk route. Where I want to shift now is historically, and again, my perspective is as a historian, and to talk a bit about the effect that war has on the production of silk in a place like Cambodia. And the war I'm, I'm really referring to, of course, is the Vietnam War that raged from, let's say, the 1950s into the 1970s. And why this related to Cambodia is, of course, the war is fought here in the United States involved in trying to contain the spread of certain ideologies and um, ideas here, but they bombed this whole territory um, between Vietnam and Laos, and the imagery here, the, all of these red uh, dots here are the bombs that went right into Cambodia and up into Laos. And the statistics from the United States owning this act are over two million tons of um, dynamite were placed, or mines were uh, dropped here in Cambodia. The effect of that was an incredible destabilization of the Cambodian government at the time, which in part led to the beginning of one of the worst regimes in modern history, which of course is the Khmer Rouge. And in that period, ideologically, both, oh, at least what I'm talking about here, both Buddhism and silk were outlawed. And it may seem like a far stretch to you, well, within a communist extremist regime, religion is seen as, as competitive and or inappropriate to the ideology. But why silk? Why would silk be outlawed? And part of it had to do with um, the Khmer Rouge wanting India to be inward looking, not wanting to be part of that silk route, not wanting to be part of a global economy, but also silk was considered a bourgeois production and a bourgeois material. And so it was outlawed for two reasons, one to be inward and the other to be, um, you know, to create a kind of peasant ideology of the country. And so silk was aggressed against, literally. The mulberry bushes were, were hacked uh, in, a, in a very violent and known way. Silk was outlawed. Uh, and its production literally stopped in the mid-70s. And it's only really been uh, since the 1990s that Cambodia has been able to rethink and reimagine itself in the modern world, in a global world. Uh, they do have a constitutional monarchy, and they are an autonomous country now um, that is self-determined. And if we, if we go forward here, there are institutions within uh, Cambodia that are seeking to build back the silk industry. Uh, one of the most well-known is the Artisans of Angkor, which is a government-supported industry that seeks to bring workshops into the cities of Cambodia and bring people in to learn and um, actually propagate mulberry um, agriculture again and to start spinning and weaving again. Um, other external agencies um, like the internal or the International Trade Center are also supporting the spread and the development of silk industries as a way to build the economy and build the culture of, of Cambodia again. And, and you can see that silk and Buddhism go hand in hand in Cambodia today. They both um, have had a significant and very important return. Um, a, something like the International Trade Center is part of the World Trade Organization and the United Nations. So this is really a, a truly international body seeking to support um, the production of silk and silk projects in Cambodia. 
when I was there, I went into the mulberry um, plantations. They are quite young. They're very fragile. Um, it is a, a new industry that is beginning again from the ground up. Um, Cambodia is predominantly an agricultural country, so they are going to do very well in bringing the mulberry trees back. Uh, you all know that the mulberry is what the worms eat that then spin into the cocoons that, that make the silk. Um, and here are some of the cocoons that are festering here in uh, these uh, mulberry branches. And um, then they can't kill all of them because then you wouldn't have a new uh, transformation into moths and worms again. So they do kill a certain amount of the, the worms as the threads have been made. And then they take these cocoons and they put them, as you see here, in hot water. Um, and with this wooden spoon, they can start to find the threads and then spin them um, here on the spindle that you're looking at. And one thing that your eye may pick up immediately is that many of these mechanical devices precisely are mechanical devices. They are hand devices, and many of them date back from the 19th century. Um, uh, there is a certain memory of generations of people that knew how to do this, um, and they teach a younger generation, but this is the kind of infrastructure that uh, we see throughout Cambodia, uh, is the revival of these um, really turn-of-the-century devices and mechanical devices. And I was just entirely enthralled by seeing a whole industry of handmade silk, hand-spun silk, um, and then hand-woven silk with what felt like um, I was going back in time. Um, and so these are some of the images that I brought back of the silks that had been, um, well, this color, of course, is the natural color of the silk, and then others had been, um, had been dyed. This is also, interestingly enough, a color you see everywhere in Cambodia because it's the color of the robes of monks um, and nuns. And they don't wear silk, they wear cotton, but it's dyed in this color. Um, and these are the kinds of looms that are being used, which are similar to our treadle looms here. Uh, again, uh, these are hand industries uh, that's slow, methodical work. It is certainly not for mass production. And they are still doing, as you can see here, this detail is of um, ecot weft uh, silk. And I'd just like to conclude with um, a statement that uh, as we establish trade and industry and economic relations with Cambodia, we must be mindful of the history of the region, especially in regards to the importance of the specialized hand labor of its people. If, for instance, we seek to introduce massive, highly technological factories for the production of silk, we may stunt the meaningful growth and expression of the Cambodian people and once again subject them to another shock of violence. Instead, we must meet the Cambodian people and their burgeoning silk industry where they are and forge a partnership of mutual respect and benefit. And like my colleague earlier spoke, what is going to be the gift of Cambodia to the fashion industry or to the apparel industry is really what is unique to them and whatever relations we form I think must take into consideration the extreme history um, that Cambodia has come through and come through so beautifully. Thank you. So thanks so much, Professor Bloom, for the silk industry there. It's really exciting what's happening in Southeast Asia right now. Um, we're very active, my company Tiger Trade, we're very active in Southeast Asia, as I mentioned, and that's because of the huge opportunity that really exists there. As you guys are all well aware that China has been the number one exporter for apparel, decor industries for the last 15 years. But what's happening right now is that labor costs have been ri rising in China, there's pressure on the yuan to appreciate, and so costs are going up. And as be because costs are going up, you have all of the major brands, retailers, and wholesalers moving out of China, and the number one region they're going to is Southeast Asia. Um, after China, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Cambodia are the top apparel manufacturers and exporters in the world. This means that they have highly sophisticated, huge factories that can really cater to the US, European, international apparel markets. When you guys look at all the clothes you're wearing, whether you're wearing brands like Aeropostale, Juicy Couture, Calvin Klein, Armani Exchange, they're all already producing in Southeast Asia. 
So these brands are very active all there already. Um, there's massive factories with um, high-level technology that's able to cater to the US and European international markets. And it's a really exciting time for, for the industry and for Southeast Asia. Because um, what's happening is these, all these markets are growing, and so the markets are no longer just US and Europe, but also China, South Korea, Japan, and even within the Southeast Asia region. Just last month, we hosted 12 buyers from Vietnam to visit textile mills in Indonesia. So we see that inter-ASEAN trade growing as well. So it's really exciting what's happening there. I hope you all had interesting perspective on the fashion, apparel, and textile industries across the region, both from a historic perspective as well as from a very fashion-forward perspective. And we really open it up to questions now. Thank you. I'm Tamika, ITM major and professor, Parma Rats class. Hi, I'm Valerie Steele from the museum, and I've got a question for Anna and also for Svita if she's still online, which is um, Indonesia also like Cambodia has a very long tradition of making really beautiful hand-woven um, textiles. And I'm wondering to what extent the international and Southeast Asian fashion industry is actually utilizing these textiles as opposed to the mass-produced um, Chinese textiles. Well, I can take this uh, first just from my experience, Valerie, is that um, some of the high-end production of, of ECOT weaving is really for the tourist industry. So they're making these specialty scarves or wall hangings uh, that are really represent Cambodia and historical Cambodia. There's also, and I just didn't have time to talk about it, there's a resurgence of really uh, fabulously carefully woven textiles for Buddhist temples. And these are donation textiles that wealthy people within Cambodia would then commission. And this, this has a very long tradition. In fact, the historical weaving I showed you was for, it was a nine foot long uh, hanging for a temple. When it comes to um, clothing that might, or fabric like that that might be tailored for a, an international market. While I was there, there was a great interest in having collaborations with designers that could anticipate and or help make meaningful collaborations for the use of either pieces of that fabric and or whole pieces of handmade silk. But there just didn't seem to be the same kind of infrastructure of designers in Cambodia that we're seeing in other parts like we discussed today. So I think Cambodia is really a place that's very open for working collaboratively with designers uh, or having people come in and helping uh, create innovative ideas that could have an international market. There is a new movement that we make the fashion, uh, the ikat, relevant to modern days. So um, the weaving pattern is uh, being re-engineered, re, re so that it can be cut uh, to modern wear. And um, I think, I believe that the lady who leads the project of Cita Tenun Indonesia, she was in New York and also visited FIT. And that was, <clears throat> that was, uh, really telling her journey of how to change the paradigm of weaving as for the traditional clothing, which is more like sarong, to um, modern wear and bringing, infusing the color, the pattern um, to, to, the, to the weavers. And also, um, in Jakarta Fashion Week itself, we have a few collaborations. One that I mentioned before, Laura Miles came to Indonesia. And then we work with India. We exchange um, fabric, exchange designers. And um, we are going to do a collaboration with uh, Korean designers with their handbook. Um, so it's evolving. Um, 
I know a lot of European designers use batik prints, but they don't use actual batik, partly probably because they, it does tend to be woven and made in sarong lengths. And I wonder if there's any initiative to make uh, longer lengths of true batik fabric, which could then be sold to designers worldwide. I mean, there are batik uh, makers who are doing that. It's not the, the, the hand-painted batik, but it's the printed batik, mm -hmm. uh, still traditional, still using wax, um, but it's more like, like, like the Lito method. Um, that can be done. But I think it's also, it is still more expensive than if a designer doing printed, uh, modern printing uh, batik. And for that reason, it's not that popular. It's, I, my, my, my feeling is about the cost. Hi, my name is Nana. Um, this question is for Anna. I'm wondering, um, I want to ask about Cambodia's silk industry. Do you think that their production can meet the needs of the Western designers? And do you think if that were to be so, that the government would not interfere with the silk production, possibly, in the nearest future? I think that it's a really good question, first off, and um, Cambodia is an extreme example. I mean, each of these countries has their own history, and this new industry, or relatively new burgeoning of silk industry, is one that the government is very much involved in. And so I think your question about how does the market then um, get involved or, or collaborate with or interact with is, is going to be region-specific. And I think that it, I think the Cambodian government and the people themselves want this industry to support them the way it has for thousands of years. They have a, a, a profound awareness of that history. How that will work out, I think, is very delicate. And so th I think your question is well placed. I don't really think I can answer it other than to say that it's to the government's interest and they've put so much energy in creating this artisans of Encore. Anyone going to Sam Reap to see the ruins um, are going to be filtered in through seeing something about the silk industry. So they're doing everything they can to promote it as part of their national identity and part of their national growth in terms of economy. So I would say that the roads are open, but I think it's going to be specific region by region. Thank you very much. If I could just add to that. Um, the, the title of the forum is really Southeast Asia, the, new, the next engine of growth. And some of you may not be aware, but um, all the 10 ASEAN Association of Southeast Asian Nation uh, member countries um, did sign an AFTA or an ASEAN free trade agreement. So there, there's, there should be an ASEAN free trade area. Mm -hmm. um, which is supposed to grow and being developed soon. And I think that will influence to, to a great extent how government yeah. will respond to market forces because there, is, there are general commitments to open up uh, markets, to develop. And when you do open up markets, um, you do have to develop your, your domestic industries at the same time because you don't want them to be, you know, to be obliterated or to disappear altogether without, you know, without being competitive. So, so I think um, I, I would agree with, with Professor Bloom that you know, the government would, would support this thing. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole. I'm a student in ITM. Um, my question is in regards to the TPP. Um, I know that a few of the countries that we were talking about is not in talks or is not officially part of the TPP yet, but I was wondering if you see it having a profound effect on the future of Southeast Asia. Um, the, the TP um, the, the TPP, um, are you familiar with the TPP? It's, it's the Trans-Pacific um, Partnership Agreement, which the U.S. is now pushing for under the Obama administration. With they're, they're, they're still in the initial phases, and they've chosen some countries. Southeast Asian, uh, well, the Philippines is not, is not part of that, although um, we have received assurances from the U.S. Trade Representative Office, the USTR, which really you know, determines um, U.S. trade policy 
globally. Um, and um, right now, because the TPP it's, is still in its infancy, we, we can't really say how it will affect our industries. But in the case of the Philippines, um, we do have a long history, a long trading history with the US. We don't see it affecting major industries at this point. And we've also received assurances from the USTR, from the US government, that um, the TPP won't really affect um, our major industries, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. In the meantime, we have to push for legislation which is also favorable to us, like the Save Our Industries Act. But right now, it's not a matter of, of critical concern, but it is a matter that we're closely monitoring. Nicole, thanks for that question. Actually, um, our two of our presenters for the Vietnam and Malaysia unfortunately had um, other commitments suddenly and they weren't able to join us, but Vietnam and Malaysia are two of the countries that will be benefiting um, significantly from the TPP. Um, out of Southeast Asia, it's Vietnam, Malaysia, and Singapore that are TPP countries. And you know, Vietnam is already, as I mentioned, a really big player in the apparel and textile industry worldwide and particularly on their exports to the United States. We expect their membership of the TPP to really considerably um, give them another advantage because they will be getting um, you know, duty-free rates for, um, for exports of apparel and textiles into the United States. So we definitely foresee an advantage um, for all the, all the Southeast Asian countries that are going to be part of the TPP. Malaysia and Singapore are a little bit more expensive, so they are not big exporters anymore in terms of apparel and textiles, only for more higher value products. But Vietnam definitely will be a big um, benefactor. And as Tess mentioned, there are, you know, it's currently in negotiations um, regarding the yarn forward rule and a lot of the other rules around this trade ne trade negotiation, but um, the Obama administration is really behind the TPP. We expect this to be the first major trade agreement that passes through the Obama administration, and we, you know, we're expecting to see it happen like this term. So um, thanks, Nicole. And we're excited, so stay tuned for that. And once the TPP passes, we do expect other Southeast Asian countries to also join the TPP. And as Tess mentioned, there is an ASEAN free trade area, so there is a lot of promotion going on within the Southeast Asia region among the ASEAN countries for interregional trade as well. So they'll be benefiting from the TPP through those means. Any other questions from our from our great audience here? Okay, great. So we'll be wrapping up. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Christine Pomerantz, the head of the International Trade and Marketing Program here at FIT for organizing this wonderful event. Thank you for inviting all of us. Thank you all for coming. And there's actually refreshments outside. Um, so hope you guys can join us for refreshments afterwards and we're happy to answer any other questions. Thank you. Thank you.